Our next guest speaker, uh, well, not guest, but our next speaker is Dave Blinn. He's our coverage expert at Lowball and Lynch in our San Francisco office. He just celebrated his, celebrated if, if that's the word, um, uh, 30 years with Lowball and Lynch. He's one of our most senior attorneys uh, and shareholders in our San Francisco office. He's a very knowledgeable, has a great deal of experience, and I'd like to uh, welcome him to present to you on the hot coverage cases, insurance coverage cases that have recently come out. Dave Lynn. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, 30 years. When I started, I had hair. Although I don't know how many of you remember our former partner, John Margolis, who was a great attorney and wonderful mediator. John was about five years older than me and was a senior associate when I started. And he looked at me and said, yeah, it's going. And uh, I already knew that, but um, yeah. Um, so anyways, I want to thank you all for being here today. I'm going to try and balance how I get this over the microphone, because I've got a really bad cold, and I'm still trying to get my voice back. So bear with me. Um, oh, perfect. There we go. Uh, that wasn't it. Okay. You were here for the pre-training. I wasn't. That'd probably be easier. Yeah, there we go. So don't press that button. No, no. Press this one to go forward and that one to go back. Perfect, thanks. Okay, um, so I've got materials here regarding coverage cases. And uh, we'll start with the most recent Supreme Court decisions. We're waiting on a few and we'll We'll get to those next because there's a couple that are interesting ones that are pending. The first case here, though, is Hartford Casualty Insurance versus JR Marketing. Uh, this is a case from last year. And in this particular case, uh, Hartford had insured uh, a company called Noble Locks Enterprises and JR Marketing LLC, another company. And both parties were sued in an action for alleged business related intentional and negligent claims in Marin County Superior Court. They tendered to Hartford, and Hartford, largely because they were saying that the acts took place before their policy period, uh, denied coverage on the claim, and they weren't going to defend them. Uh, Hartford uh, uh, later did agree to defend them, but didn't provide them with Kumis counsel. Uh, the, defend the insureds then brought an action to enforce the uh, in enforce and require get them Kumis counsel, and at that point, under an order from the court, Hartford then provided Kumis counsel and began paying their bills. Now, a significant part of this case is that in the order by the trial court that uh, required the Kumis counsel, the court said, you know, you did not provide your insured with uh, coverage right off the bat, bat here, so you're not gonna be entitled to the, the protections under insurance code section 2860, the Kumis statute. You're not gonna be allowed to say, you know, here's the hourly rate, uh, this is what we pay our, our, through our panel counsel, so that's all we're paying for Kumis. Court said, you're stuck, you're out of, the, out of the gate on that. But it is fair to, for you to be able to say if a bill is reasonably related to the, the uh, services that they're providing for your insureds or not. So they said, well, you can reserve till afterwards in a collection action whether, you, whether their bills were excessive or not. Well, the case settled and Hartford was, was provided with invoices from Kumis Council totaling over $15 million. So. <laughs> You be the judge of whether it was excessive or not. But um, uh, Hartford paid the charges, and then it filed a cross-complaint because the coverage action was still pending until the whole matter was resolved. Hartford filed a coverage action against the Kumis Council in this case, and um, they were seeking to collect for uh, unjust enrichment and seeking reimbursement of monies paid under the enforcement order. The uh, lawyers demurred to the, the cross-complaint and said that, you know, look, the... the there's an order that you defend this, 2860 says you, or 2860 rights that you have are already gone, there's no basis for this claim. And the trial court sustained the demur uh, without, leave to, without leave to amend this to the firm and Hartford appealed. Uh, the Court of Appeal looked at it and said, yeah, you know, when a carrier initially refuses to defend their insured, they're out of luck, you know, you, you've gotta pay these bills. Hartford took it up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, you know, 
Generally, you're right. Carriers, we encourage them to defend. But I think a significant issue, and maybe it may limit the effect of this case, was the trial court had said that Hartford still had the right to object to bills as being not reasonable um, or being uh, not necessary. So the Supreme Court sent this one back down for a look at whether it was reasonable or necessary. And again, that's kind of something specific, but the, the I think the learning point there is if a carrier gets itself in a situation where it's ordered to pay for Kuma's counsel, it no longer has rights under 2860, but the important thing would be to make sure that your attorney does ask the court for the uh, right to question whether bills are reasonable or related. Oh, uh, Floor versus Superior Court. Floor is um, a, a case that involved um, a company that manufactured over a number of years a, a bunch of different a, a bunch of different um, products that were involved in a lot of these different asbestos type cases. Um, over the years, Hartford had insured them, and over the years, it defended them uh, in uh, hundreds of cases over about a 25-year period. Well, what had happened, though, in the middle of all this was Floor had done kind of a, uh, they'd done kind of a reverse, a reverse uh, change of company. So they basically passed on, they created a new company, Floor 2, that handled all of this work, and they moved all of its assets, liabilities, and interests over to the new company, Floor 2. Well, Floor 2 was sued in some of these actions. Hartford was defending them, but then they said, wait a minute, we don't have to defend you. So they brought, in, they brought a claim against uh, Floor 2 for deck relief. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Floor 2 actually was the one that brought the deck relief action, even though they were being defended in a few. But they knew what was coming down the road. Um, they argued that they were entitled to uh, the coverage under the claim. Hartford pinned itself on the fact that its policy said you cannot... Um, you cannot uh, assign your rights without our permission under this policy. And there was a case called Henkel that in 2003 the Supreme Court had looked at and decided, yeah, you know, that's pretty much uh, going to be the way it works out because if a policy says you can't assign it, then you can't assign it unless there's a judgment there before the assignment. Well, in this case, these are cases that are still pending. So you can't say that there was a judgment. Um, Floor couldn't rely on Henkel, and it couldn't rely on the fact that it had any judgments. But Floor's argument is that there's an insurance code section 520, and uh, that was not even paid attention to in the Henkel case, but I, it was not even mentioned. And it's an old section; it predates mostly a, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of the insurance industry. In fact, it was picked up from the civil code before then. But what insurance code 520 says is an agreement not to transfer the claim of the insured against the insured after a loss has happened is void if made before the loss, except as otherwise provided. So what that boils down to, though, is if the, if the loss has already happened, um, you can't transfer the claim unless, or, or, or the, the, the insurer has no responsibility unless the transfer was after the loss has happened uh, and uh, the Hartford in this case said, well, there's been no judgment, so you don't have a loss yet. But what the court said is, you know, that's one susceptible opinion, but really the loss here is when each of these employees got injured by asbestos or each of these people got injured by asbestos. So the loss predated the change over to floor two, and they were entitled to the coverage because they weren't enlarging the scope of anything. Rather than floor being responsible, because floor is the entity that was involved when all this product were being sold, Floor 2, which was going to be the one being sued at this point, was entitled to pick up that coverage. Nickerson versus Stonebridge Life. Um, this is kind of an interesting case. Uh, Mr. Nickerson was already paralyzed before all this began, uh, and he fell and broke his leg uh, when his wheelchair lift tipped over inside the van. Uh, he was taken to the Veterans Hospital, and he remained in there because of various complications 109 days. Uh, he had a policy with Stonebridge Life Insurance that would pay him for uh, $350 a day for every day that he spent in there for reasonable and necessary treatment. He made a claim to Stonebridge after he got out, and Stonebridge took a look at it, and they checked with their doctors, and their doctors said, eh, only 18 of those 189 days are necessary. So they offered him like 11000 or, or less, basically based on the 18 days. 
Um, he filed suit alleging that Stonebridge had breached his insurance contract by failing to pay his benefits over the full 109 days. Um, at trial, he was awarded 31,500, which was the unpaid benefits for those extra days. Um, on the bad faith cause of action, he was awarded $35,000 by the jury. Um, they also found that he'd engaged, that Stonebrook had engaged in conduct with fraud and awarded $19 million in punitive damages. Um, of course, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court has said a ratio of anything over 10 to 1 in punitive damages is, is going to be looked at suspiciously and basically under all but the most extreme circumstances, we're going to cut everything to 10 to 1. So that in, this, in that case, that would have meant cutting this to 350000 uh, The trial court granted a new trial to uh, Stonebridge unless Nickerson content, consented to a uh, lowering of the punitive damages to 350000 He rejected it, uh, and he appealed the order granting a new trial. Meanwhile, what had been going on, though, was one of the things that was involved here is uh, if I, you're probably all familiar with the phrase brant fees. And in brant fees, that's when an insured has to sue its carrier for, for getting coverage on a matter. And under Brandt, you're entitled to get those attorney's fees that you spend against your insurance company trying to get them to give you coverage. Well, Brandt fees are considered a damage. And in this particular case, the Brandt fees that were awarded post-verdict by the court were $12,500. So the argument that went up when this case went up on appeal was, OK, $35,000 was the damages under the uh, bad faith claim. But you also have to add the Brandt fees of 12500 So that increases by 125000 the punitive damages in this case. And ultimately, that was the decision, is that Brandt fees are a damage, and they've got to be considered. Now, Nickerson or Stonebridge had tried to argue that the parties had agreed that rather than a jury hearing what those fees were, the Brandt fees, and adding that in as damages there, it was going to be done post-verdict. And they said, well, that should make a difference as to whether these are damages for punitive damages purposes. And the court said, no. Damages are damages. We're going to add that in after the fact. So the punitive damages in this case would be 350000 plus 125000 Still a little better than, than $19 million. Uh, Gradius versus Lincoln General Insurance Company. This is a case that basically the, um, the Supreme Court has been asked by the Ninth Circuit to answer a question about whether an injury arises out of the use of the vehicle for purposes of determining coverage under an automobile insurance policy and the insurance company's duty to defend. Uh, the question that they want the Supreme Court to answer is whether a vehicle was a predominating, predominating cause or substantial factor, if that's what it has to arise to, or whether there is a minimal causational connection. And the problem here was um, plaintiff was plaintiff was on a bus. The bus driver parked the bus in a secluded area, and then he raped her. Um, the, she filed suit against the bus driver and the owner of the bus. Ultimately, the owner stipulated entry of judgment around $2 million for the victim and 500000 for her husband, uh, and then assigned all rights against Lincoln General, who was the insurance company for the bus. And Lincoln General denied coverage, saying, this is an auto policy. This didn't rise out of the use of the bus. The bus took you to a spot, and that's where this happened. So uh, the Supreme Court wants to, or the, the federal court wants the Supreme Court to tell it, hey, in a situation like this, are we going to just give them, uh, is coverage owed if there's minimal causation contacts between the use of the car and not, or do it have to be a substantial factor? Because I think it's pretty clear to anyone's mind that this wouldn't be a substantial factor, but the federal court's concerned that in this instance, really, maybe as long as it's related, it should be at least potentially covered. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. It's, um, the, the, there's not a whole lot in, of argument in the case. The federal court basically just cited the facts and said this is, it, because the, the decision as it came down is essentially a call to question for the California Supreme Court. They said we can't really rule further on this until we know how California would rule on substantial factor versus minimal causal contact. So, yeah. It's, the of the oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I've been asked to repeat the questions for people on the webinar. The question was, is it common for a lower court to ask a Supreme Court for an answer? And it is not common, but it does happen from time to time 
when a federal court is applying a state law that they will ask the state law for clarification because they don't want to clarify an issue that differing courts in the state of California, perhaps different court of appeals in the state of California might look differently. And it, particularly if you have, say, you know, the, you've got uh, the 6th District, which is San Jose, South Bay. Uh, the 6th District Court of Appeal for California might say something. 4th District in Southern California might say something else. And then you've got a federal Ninth Circuit, which covers kind of the whole area. They're going, well, geez, which do these go by? We can make California law, or we can ask the California Supreme Court, what's the determination, de determining factor in this case? So basically, that's been, it's been put in the line for the California Supreme Court to answer that question so they, they can then go back and decide this case. Uh, the next one that we've got is another case where the, um, the Supreme Court was, was asked to make a determination and, the, and, and to answer what was going on. And this is uh, Guam Industrial Services versus Zurich American. Uh, the short of this case was that um, the insured, which is Guam Industrial Services, had a dry dock that uh, sank. And when it sank, they had sealed barrels containing 113,000 gallons of oil uh, that went into the water. Fortunately, none of these leaked out, but of course they had to recover them. Um, and they recovered them all to avoid fines and they, they got everything up and then they submitted a bill to their insurer of, of the cost of getting this all out at $647,000. And two different policies. There was a uh, hull and machinery policy that was issued uh, for various perils but that one had a requirement that there was a Navy certification, which is the higher standard of, standard of warranty for the dock. You have to have that certification to say, this is a dock that any, any, any um, ship can come into. It's basically saying this is the top line best practices dock. This one didn't have that kind of certification. It, it did have a commercial certification, but that had expired before this happened. So what the, what the uh, Court, what the uh, circuit court in this case did, they looked at Guam law, and Guam law follows California law. Uh, and so the district court was applying California law and said, yeah, you know, when you've got a policy that requires certification, that's pretty clear, and the language is not ambiguous, so they were deciding that under that policy, there was no coverage. Now, there was a second policy, an ocean marine policy, that had coverage for this matter, but it did have a pollution exclusion. Um, and the, uh, the carrier said in that case, you know, th this, uh, this is not a discharge, so we don't cover it. Uh, and the, uh, court, the district court said, yeah, you're right. It's, the dissent disagreed, but the district court said, barrels going into the ocean sealed isn't pollution. If they'd left it and it started leaking, it would be. But in this case, they didn't, and it, and it uh, was determined not to be anything that met the pollution standard for sudden and accidental uh, disbursement. Uh, Katie versus Midcontinental. One last federal case here. Now, Katie was a masonry contractor and he installed stone masonry siding on some, uh, con on some residential homes in a multi multi-family home project. Um, after he was completed, he was called out because there were some cracks uh, in the masonry caps and, and some in the wall. He fixed those and left the project and about three months after he'd inspected these, he bought a one-year commercial policy from Mid-Continent. Later, the Homeowners Association for the project sued the general contractor who in turn sued all the subcontractors, including Katie, for their work on the project. Katie uh, tendered to his carrier, Mid-Continent, and said, I'm being sued, you know, for this defective work. Mid-Continent Mid denied coverage saying, you were out there three months before you got our policy. You saw you had cracks. You knew about this issue. Our policy doesn't cover known losses and this is a known loss to you. Um, the, you know, Katie's argument was, I may have known that I had some cracks, but now they're saying that the further cracking that's taken place after this has caused damage to the structural uh, members behind the framing and there's a lot of consequential damage that wasn't there at the time. Um, the carrier tried to argue that this was one long continuous loss and that they, since Katie knew about it, there was no coverage. Um, the district court initially, the trial court had agreed with them on that, but the, the uh, appeals court looked at this and said, no, you know, the insurance policy continuously talks about your work 
in one situation and it doesn't cover your work. It does cover damage to other people's work because of damages from your work. And it said, if you're gonna treat your work differently from the work product of others, which may have coverage, and if the only knowledge the insured had originally was damage to the insured's work, but not anything else to anybody else's work, there wasn't a known loss in this situation. International Insurance Company of Hanover versus ACW Construction. Uh, in this case, um, the, uh, the, the Andrews family, it was a husband and wife, Richard and um, Rebecca Andrews. They were the, the president and secretary of, a, of ACW Corporation, which was a general contractor company. And they, uh, they, uh, the Andrews personally entered into a contract with their own construction company to build a home. Uh, they acted, the ACW, which was the con general contracting company, was the general contract on the project, hired various subcontractors. Well, one of ACW's own employees left some <laughs> oily rags somewhere on the project and up the home went. The Andrews went to ACW's insurer, which in this case was uh, uh, the International Insurance Company of Hanover and said, hey, we have a claim against ACW's policy because one of ACW's employees did something which caused damage to our home. We need it replaced. We want you guys to pay for it. Uh, Hanover said, we're not going to cover this claim. You're the Andrews. The Andrews own ACW. We, we're not paying you for your own loss, besides which we have, we don't cover, we don't cover you for damages of, of other insureds, and you are insureds under the policy. Well, what the, what the uh, court said in this case was, if you look at, if you look at uh, the, the corporate structure, yeah, Richard Andrews is the, is the president, and Mrs. Andrews is the secretary, and they are named insureds because of that. But they're named insurers for purposes of their work on behalf of ACW Corporation. They are suing in their capacity as the homeowners here, Richard and, and Richard and um, not the, as the Andrews, the owners of the building. They weren't being sued as a, they weren't being sued themselves. They were suing their company. Their company was uh, the one that caused the problem, and you didn't have a cross-insured situation here because they weren't named insureds for purposes of living in the home, just for the business of what, whatever ACW was doing. So in, in that situation, it was okay for them to sue themselves. Liberty Surplus, surplus versus Ledsma and Meyer. This is another case where there, there was a question being asked of the Supreme Court whether an occurrence under an employer's general liability policy when an injured third party brings claims against the employer for negligent hiring, retention, and supervision of the employee who injured the third party. And what happened here was Ledsma and Meyer Construction Company uh, entered into a construction contract with the uh, San Bernardino County Unified School District to complete various uh, construction projects. So they have been out there working on the project for several years. They went from 2003 to 2006, seven school year, working on renovating and upgrading the school. Well, in 2003, early on in the project, Ledsma had hired Daryl Hecht and assigned him to the project as assistant superintendent. He was the brother-in-law or son-in-law of one of the owners. Um, the allegation of the complaint is, wait a minute, when you hired him, you knew he was a registered sex offender that you're putting over here at this school. Well, in October of 2006, suit was filed by the family of a 13-year-old who attended the middle school who said that she'd been taken to the job shed by Mr. Hecht and she'd been sexually assaulted by Mr. By Mr. Hecht. Ledsma was sued, the school district was sued um, for, uh, for basically negligent hiring and negligent supervision of Mr. Hecht. Um, they, the school district tendered this to Ledsma's insurance company and they in turn uh, denied coverage on the case, but the issue that's gone up for the Supreme Court on this matter is, wait a minute, you've got a school district that's been sued here for negligent hiring of the contractor's employee, is that an occurrence under the policy? So it's kind of a big issue uh, that has not come up, or at least hasn't come up for the Supreme Court to look at before. But negligent hiring is all over school cases. It's all over a lot of them, a lot of uh, liability cases. So we are waiting for this one. It's it's been sit they've been sitting on it for 
just a couple of months now, and I don't anticipate we're gonna get an answer until sometime next year, but this will be, a, I think, a big case to look at because if it's an occurrence, if negligent hiring is an occurrence, there's potentially coverage under a lot more of these policies. Uh, Syntex Homes versus St. Paul Fire and Marine. This was uh, actually, a, uh, we, we had this, we covered as one of our weekly law resumes last year. My partner, Joe Finnick, actually did a great job on the WLR on this one. Um, any of you that do construction defect are probably well familiar with Syntex Homes and you're probably also familiar with St. Paul Fire and Marine, Marine Insurance Company and Travelers and the positions they take when they represent general contractors, particularly Syntex Homes in these kinds of cases. Syntex was sued for uh, defects in a number of single family residences in Corona, California. Uh, they cross complained against all their subcontractors. They also tendered all their subcontractors as additional insureds. One of those was St. Paul Fire and Marine for one of the, one of the subs. St. Paul slash Travelers picked up the defense, uh, hired panel counsel and was defending the case. While the case is going on, Centex had this action pending against the subs, which it, it amended to include against the subs by the way, none of you are picking up our defense, so we're gonna sue you for failing to pick up the defense or failing to name us as additional insureds. And at the same time though, Centex brought a couple of causes of action for declaratory relief against travelers, saying, you've defended us under a reservation of rights, you've hired your panel counsel, you're putting us in a bad spot here where your panel counsel is gonna do everything they can to minimize anything for us. And we think that you might end up having your panel counsel do bad things that will harm us. They also wanted, um, they also wanted a determination as to what the fees and costs would be, how they'd be allocated amongst the parties. Well, the, at the trial, the, the travelers demurred to this and said, neither of these issues is right. You know, we've, we're defending you at this point. Uh, we're still trying to get everybody else on board our defense counsel hasn't done anything yet. You've raised the possibility of things, but nobody's done anything. The trial court agreed with them on this, and the Court of Appeal ultimately agreed and affirmed the demur, and they said that this was, this was uh, it was not moot, it was actually not ripe in this situation, because although there were allegations that Centex felt maybe the panel counsel lawyers might not do the right thing, there was no evidence that they hadn't yet, so there was no cause of action against travelers at this time for that. And the second issue was as to allocation of, of monies, everybody was still being brought in. And panel counsel would have as much interest in limiting traveler's response, or excuse me, in limiting Centex responsibility and getting it shot out to all the other subcontractors as Centex would. So you don't have any conflicts there and you also don't have a situation yet where you could determine who owes what because they hadn't, hadn't paid out the monies yet. So uh, this is the kind of declaratory relief action that has to fall on a second track. It can't be made part of the same lawsuit. We've seen tons of them though where they do it in a separate action and it's joined or tracks along with it, but basically what the Court of Appeal for the Fourth, fourth Appellate District here said is you can't bring it at this time, at least not uh, in this particular case. Um, underwriters of interest subscribing to policy number A1527401, technically rather than underwriters, um, versus Probability Specialty Insurance Company. So you have underwriters and you have pro builders who are two different carriers for Pacific Trades, who's a contractor. Pacific Trades was named as a defendant in a construction defects lawsuit in April of 2007. They tendered it to both the carriers. Um, underwriters picked up the defense, pro builders did not. Pro builders said, we're not picking up the defense because our policy says that we have the duty to do so unless you are currently being defended by another carrier. So they said, you have another carrier defending you under the other, other insurance or pr provision of this policy, we don't have to come in. Um, underwriters continued to defend the case, had hired counsel, they ended up settling the case for about a million dollars, underwriters paid a million, pro builders did contribute to the defense about, or to the settlement of about 270,000, Afterwards, underwriters filed an equitable contribution claim against pro builders and said that really what you're saying is we're not gonna defend you because someone else is, def is, is defending you and that's an escape clause and the courts don't like other insurance provisions that are effectively an escape clause letting one, one carrier out. The modern trend is 
everybody could have those in their policies. You're not going to make this first one in as the one that bears everything, so we're going to share these costs. And that's what the Court of Appeal did in this case. They didn't give, they didn't give pro builders the out of the other insurance, and they said we're now going to look at what the equitable, equitable fair sharing between pro builders and underwriters would be for defending uh, uh, Pacific Trades in this case. Amco Insurance versus All Solutions. Um, in this case, I, I'm going to have to take a look at the facts here just a little because it'll, it's a little complex. Uh, Mr. Singh owned a two-story apartment building. The fire broke out on his property. It damaged neighboring properties, including a com commercial building owned by Mr. Sari and a restaurant operated by Mr. Ogawa and Ms. Eccles. Amco insured Mr. Sari, the first of the people I named there, uh, for his building. After the fire took place, Singh tendered his own first party claims as well as Sari's and the restaurant's claims against him to his insurance company, which was, um, I, you know, I, I got the insurance company here, but it doesn't really matter because everybody agreed that there was no policy in effect at the time. Singh had had insurance previously, but his insurance had expired. The uh, the dispute here was Singh claimed that his broker, All, All Solutions Insurance Agency, he had admitted that they said to him, your policy is expiring, you're going to need to renew. They said, we sent him two estimates, what do you want to do? He said, I told them go this way. That's the whole dispute in the case here. There was no dispute though that he ended up having no liability insurance himself. So what happened is Singh then gets sued by, uh, gets sued by everyone. Singh gets sued by Saris. He gets sued by the restaurateurs. And after after the uh, restaurant, the restaurant or after Saris Insurance Company Amco pays for his damages, they come in place of Saris. So you've got Amco and the restaurant suing Singh. They end up taking a judge, stipulated judgment against him and taking his rights against All Solutions, the broker. So the two of them then go after the broker and say, "But for your failure to get this insurance." this would have been Mr. Singh's and Mr. Singh's insurance company's responsibility. Well, at trial, All Solutions argued the rule of superior equities comes into play here. We didn't cause this fire. We were involved in the insurance. You provided insurance, and what you, pay ins what, what you get paid for your insurance for is to pay out in this situation. We're both in the same situation. And what they were doing was relying on a case that had come out about five years earlier, Dabas versus Vitus, where a gentleman who had a horse had a couple different insurance policies. Horse gets out, causes a fatality. The insurance policies get brought into the claim, but there was a gap. There was a lack of some of the insurance because of a problem with the broker. In that case, the court said when, when uh, the plaintiffs tried to sue the broker in that situation, or, the, or actually the carrier tried to sue the broker for the missing insurance, the court said, hey, you, Mr. Broker, and you, insurance company, you're both in the same role vis-a-vis -vis this loss. We're not going to command the broker to pay in in this situation here because of the, the doctrine of superior equity said neither one of you is superior to the other in this situation. You're out of luck. Well, the difference between Davis versus Vitus in this case was in Davis versus Vitus, you've got defendant, a would-be defendant insurer, and a broker here. In our case, we've got defendant, a broker, a different insurer for the plaintiffs or for other defendants over here. So this insurer over here, which was in this case Amco, had absolutely no relationship to Mr. Singh, the defendant, or his broker. So the court said, you're not in the same position there. This person is totally innocent. You guys, Mr. Brokers, you're in the string of the insurance company that should have been involved here had there been one. So your professional negligence is on the hook. You haven't shown that you have a superior equity against this insurance company that's paid for this loss, so they're allowed to proceed. And the difference and distinction there is whether the insurance company seeking subrogation against the broker is the insurer for the, for the defendant, which in this case they weren't, or for someone else. And because, because AMCO was not the insurer for the defendant who had the same broker in that situation, that line didn't run up the chain and, and they weren't going to look at that and say, you're all in here together, no luck. Hearn Pacific versus second generation roofing. Um, this, is a, this is what I, I like to call a cautionary tale. Um, Hearn was sued for design and construction defects by the owner of a mixed use building. It filed its cross complaint against uh, 
various subcontractors and continued to pursue them in, in the name of the general contractor. Um, Hearn was insured by RSUI and North American Specialties. Um, they ended up taking over the defense for Hearn. Uh, the complaint was amended to reflect that Hearn was still pursuing its out of pocket against the subcontractors, or the cross company, I should say, and that Hearn was, on the face of this complaint, it said Hearn is suing for the monies being paid by RSUI and, and Hearn's contractors. So essentially, it's a subrogation claim. Well, they go, up, they go up to trial against one of the remaining defendants, and that defendant, SGR, obtained a defense verdict on the equity, equitable indemnity claim against it. They ended up getting $180,000 in fees uh, against the court in one situation, they got 30,000 in costs, so they had a $210,000 judgment against Hearn. SGR, knowing where the money was, said, we want to amend this, amend this judgment uh, under th section 368.5, which is the one that allows one to sue in the name of another, and there's section 187, which allows you to amend a judgment, and we want to name these insurance companies because it was being done in their name, and we want a judgment directly against them because they can collect that a lot easier than they can against um, Hearn. The trial court said no, section 187 doesn't allow you to um, add additional judgment debtors. Only on, the only situation in which it does that is if it's an alter ego situation. You know, you're suing John Smith company and really what you need it from is John Smith. Here it's Hearn and it's Hearn's insurer. We're not gonna let you do that. The Court of Appeal reversed that and they said, you know, there's, a, there's some question as to whether 187 would allow you to do it against only alter, alter egos. But more importantly, section Section 368.5, which is again the, the statute that allows you to sue in the name of another, that section says, you know, when there's no other way to amend a judgment, this is how you're going to amend it. So in this situation, the carrier ended up being uh, brought in and named as a co co judgment debtor uh, for those 210,000 attorney's fees. Presumably, they would have had to pay them anyways, but this at least took the uh, her and out of the out of the loop and gave the insurer a lot less defenses to that money. Am I getting ahead of myself here? Let's see. Ten minutes? Oh, wow, okay. Um, then I'm going to skip... I'm going to skip D. Cummings. Uh, Herring versus Topa. I'll go through some of these quickly. Uh, in Herring versus Topa, there was a million dollar policy that was issued by the, by, the, uh, by the primary carrier to a company called California Fleet, Inc. Uh, Larry Herring owned that company. His driver was involved in a significant uh, motor vehicle accident. The underlying driver had tw limits of $25,000. So the, company, the company's driver brought an uninsured motorist action against the primary policy that they had, which was up to a million dollars worth of UM coverage. They got that million dollar limits, less the 25, and then they went over the excess policy, which was the TOPA policy. TOPA had a policy that was following form, it said, we're going to follow the form of the original policy. It also said, it also described loss in its policy as third party losses. And it also had an express exclusion for any UM, UIM claim. Um, so when they were sued for this uh, failure to pay out on the UM, UIM claim as an excess carrier, um, Topa said, look, we don't know any of this. Herring said, yeah, you do. Every policy in California has a statutory UM, UIM limits. And the court said, well, no. Every primary policy has that. With excess policies, it's what the excess policy says. And as I mentioned before, the th there were three reasons in this excess policy why they wouldn't cover it. One is it defined loss as only third party. Two is there's an exclusion for any other, or it said we'll follow the, the underlying policy unless something about the underlying policy is contrary to the terms of our policy. And since their policy excluded third, or UM, UIM, and define loss as third-party loss, there was no coverage in, in the TOPA case. Um, Baldwin versus AAA Northern California. Pretty straightforward case. Mr. Baldwin's vehicle was damaged by a driver insured by, or, uh, by AAA. Mr. Baldwin was also insured by AAA. He thought his truck, which was fairly new, was complete loss. They said, no, it's not, and we're gonna fix it, and they fixed it for, to the tune of about eight grand and gave him a rental vehicle during the time. He afterwards sued them and said the vehicle wasn't repaired to its pre-damaged state uh, and it's worth 17,000 less than it was when, before he made the repairs. And the policy said the carrier may pay the loss in money or may make repairs to return it to its normal running condition. And so the court 
agreed with, uh, with AAA in this case and said normal running condition means normal running condition. It doesn't mean normal running condition plus you know, any uh, loss in fair market value. Uh, Gonzalez, I'm going to skip that. We'll focus on some of the 2016 cases. Lloyd's versus Arch Specialty. Um, I won't go into this one in detail, but this is another case where you had two different carriers that uh, were arguing about who had to end up covering a loss uh, between Lloyd's and Arch. I believe it was Arch was saying our other insurance provision says we don't have to cover. And the, again, the court said the modern trend is um, when you have other insurance, that doesn't get you off the hook because everybody can put them in there, so you're going to share equitably. Uh, McMillan, I'm going to skip that. Albert. Um, Albert actually is kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's a tree case. And um, Ms. Albert purchased a homeowner's policy from mid century. Uh, she put some trees, she planted some trees and a fence that turned out to be on his property. Um, she was sued by the other property owner for encroachment. She tendered it to her carrier. The carrier asked her, you know, took a history from her and said, you know, did you know where the property line was when you put this on there? And she said, I believe the property line to be where I put this. These were supposed to be there. You know, I, I trimmed these because I was told I'm, I've got to keep these, these trimmed. Uh, they're on my property. Well, the other owner ended up amending the thing saying, these are my trees and uh, you've damaged my trees. She then said, hey, you owe me defense under this. And the carrier said, well, wait a minute. There's no question. You intentionally trim these trees. We don't have an accident here. An occurrence is an accident. Trimming trees intentionally is not an accident. There have been past cases that courts have looked at and said, yeah, if you've got an encroachment that you accidentally put on the wrong place, in the past, that had been determined that that might be a basis for, for coverage or for an occurrence. Um, we had a case, the State Farm case versus Delgado, which came out a few years ago, which pretty much said accident means an accident, uh, not the unintended consequences. So in this situation, she knew what she was doing when she trimmed the tree. She tried to argue maybe the tree trimmer had accidentally cut too much or there might have been an errant swing of a chainsaw, but the court said that's really straining it too far. Uh, Pasley. In Pasley, there was damage to the master bedroom and ceiling and other parts of the house after a water damage to the uh, Pasley's home. They brought a, cl a claim against uh, their carrier, State Farm. Um, State Farm took a look at it and said, we're going to pay for the damages. State Farm agreed to pay various damages, but didn't, but didn't agree to all the, all the repairs. They said that the bathroom work was remodeling. <coughs> Their experts said that you could scrape off the texturing on the ceiling in the master bedroom that had to be done, and you could just uh, repaint that rather than remove the entire ceiling, which was being done. Uh, and there was uh, an electrical panel that was replaced as well. Um, when those three items weren't covered, State Farm got sued. The trial court entered a, a ruling in favor of uh, the homeowners on breach of contract and on bad faith. Um, this was appealed. The Court of Appeals looked at this and, uh, and re reversed the bad faith ruling based on the genuine dispute doctrine, but did affirm the uh, breach of contract claim with regard to the bathroom and with regard to the, um, the ceiling issues. With the electrical panel, they said there was absolutely no dispute that that was not part of the work that needed to be replaced. But as these two other items, State Farm had argued that its experts had given it reasonable reports that said this is an upgrade, this is a remodeling the bathroom and the, and the ceiling here is something that can be done. Ultimately, the facts showed you really couldn't do this work without having done the rest of the work. So that was why the breach of contract claim was, grant was sustained. But the court said, relying on good faith opinions of your experts was sufficient to invoke the genuine dispute rule, so there was no basis for bad faith. Um, Ace American versus Fireman's Fund. Uh, Mr. Franco was injured when a, he was working on a film set when a special effects accident caused him to suffer serious injuries, including multiple fractured bones, a punctured lung, and a lot of soft tissue injuries. He sued Warner Brothers and several other entities uh, for his injuries. Warner Brothers was insured by a $2 million fireman's, fireman's fund policy and a fireman's fund policy for $3 million. 
on top of that, ACE then issued a policy above the, those two policies to 50 million. Fireman's Fund defended and uh, the Francos made settlement demands that were within the $5 million level of the two Fireman's Fund policies, but they refused to settle the case. Um, ACE later claimed, of course, that those demands were reasonable and they, they, and they were supported by substantial evidence. Well, meanwhile, case goes on. They end up getting another settlement demand and they ended up settling the case for about six and a half million. So that meant that Fireman's Fund paid its uh, $5 million worth of policies and ACE had to pay a million and a half out. ACE then brought a, um, an action against uh, Fireman's Fund for equitable subrogation and bad faith, saying you should have accepted those demands within your limits. We then have had to pay this out. Fireman's Fund relied on an old case called RLI Insurance that said when, when you're in an excess situation like that, there's got to be a judgment before you can sue for equitable relief against the underlying carrier. Um, Ace opposed it with a case called Fortman, which had been decided even earlier, but that held that excess carriers uh, could sue as long as they showed that they'd actually paid out money. And the court, in, the court of Appeal and Ace agreed with that and said, there's no question here that the excess carrier paid out a million and a half. Um, they were entitled to bring, at least bring the equitable indemnity, the equitable indemnity and bad faith claims. Uh, the defenses to that would be up to Fireman's Fund in this situation. But the whole reason for generally requiring that there's a judgment in these past cases had been, so the insured didn't end up with two different possible settlements and two different possible uh, carriers contributing when they didn't need to. Uh, almost through here, Barrickman. Um, this was a recent case, and this is one I found a little bit troublesome, but I understand where the court was going with this one. Um, Mr. McDaniel was driving while intoxicated in a car insured by Mercury Casualty, and she ran a red light and injured Laura Beth Brickman and Shannon McIntyre, who were walking in the, in the crosswalk with the lights in their favor. Um, three months later, Ms. McDaniel was <coughs> sentenced for drunk driving, and she was also ordered to pay $165,000 in criminal restitution. The day after the accident, though, um, McDaniel put her carrier, Mercury, on notice of the accident, and a month later, civil attorneys hired by the two pedestrians, uh, Britt Berrickman and McIntyre, wrote a demand letter, and they said, we'll take, you know, they said, here's, here's all our, our client's injuries. They're well in excess of, of your $15,000 per person settlement uh, authority. Here's the police report showing it's clearly your insurance fault. We want that $15,000 per to settle with your client. Uh, Mercury said, yeah, here, here's, here's, uh, here's your 15 each, send us a release. Um, so Mercury, uh, Mercury sent over a release of claims and the lawyers sent it back with their client's signatures on it, but they'd added language that said, this does not include court-ordered restitution. So that raised a real problem. Tra uh, you know, Mercury is looking at this and going, you know, have we just screwed up? Are we getting rid of any right of our insured to offset this 30,000 that we're paying against the restitution, because there is a right of offset. Um, so they wanted clarification. They went back and forth orally through emails, and they, the, the lawyer, and this is my problem with the case, is the lawyer, at least according to the facts of the case, the lawyer for the plaintiffs may have equivocated on what exactly they were looking for. You know, he said, we're trying to protect the right to restitution, but he also said, I'm not sure what the law is, and I'm not sure what the effect of this is, but ultimately, before, the case, before they went further with the case, the lawyer sent them a letter saying, look, all we're trying to do is protect the right to restitution. You've got any other rights, and in fact, under the law, you guys have the rights to, you, your client has the rights to the um, offset against whatever they're paying. We're not messing with that. Pay the settlement. The carrier didn't do it in that time because it was concerned that it was gonna be stuck with the language. They go on. They go to trial. There's a judgment in favor of one of them for 800,000, a judgment for the other for 2.2 million. They settled with uh, Timur and McDaniel, take, and they, uh, took, they took the 15 per person law limits that the carrier put up, and they then sued Mercury for the remainder. Mercury said, hey, look, we did everything right. We responded really quickly and said we'd pay the insured's rights. And they pointed to a case that came down a couple years ago that we'd had uh, Graciano versus Mercury General Corp where the court said everything in the light of everything here, the carrier acted in good faith. But the difference was in the Mercury, Graciano versus Mercury, same carrier, and that's why these guys knew this case. In Graciano, the plaintiff's attorney had sent in a case saying, dear Mercury, you're insured Joe S, Joe, Joe Smith uh, was at fault for this on this date and here's your policy number. Problem was Mercury's insured was not Joe Smith, it was John Smith and it was a different policy number. 
So Mercury looked at that at first. They sent it into their system, and they're seeing they don't have this guy. When Mercury figured out exactly which one it was, it tendered those limits. But by that time, they were saying, we're not taking this anymore. The court in the previous case, Graziano, said, look, Carrier did everything right here, tried to get rid of this one. No bad faith. Well, the difference in, in Berrickman is the carrier said, yeah, you acted quickly, but you got kind of hung up on this language. And you never even offered, and here's where what sunk Mercury is. You never even offered to say, let's revise the release to say, this is only intended to preserve the plaintiff's right to um, restitution, not to defeat an offset. That simple sentence would have taken care of the whole thing. So anyways, that's the result of that decision. There's a couple of other cases. Most of them are ones we've gone over in, in 2015 when we were here last year. Most of you were there. I could repeat them. If you've got any questions about them, I'll be happy to answer them later or uh, through an email. But I know I've taken up all of my time. Thank you. <laughs>